Hello and welcome again to the latest of our studies in our series End Times for Beginners. And you can see that this time what we are going to consider for a few minutes together is the wonderful subject of the New Jerusalem. Our last study was a very sad one. We were looking at the Last Judgment. And it's interesting how that these things that come at the end chapters, they seem to be interwoven and fit in together. We had to go down to verse number 8 in chapter 21 to get the last reference to the people that were judged. And yet when we're coming here to chapter 21, immediately after the record of what John saw at the judgment then, the Spirit of God turns him around again to see something that is very wonderful, very beautiful and very positive. And that's often how the Spirit of God has been working in these studies. When John is showing something which is very negative and terrible and sometimes infernal and associated with the dragon and all his power and the judgment of God, then we get something that is beautiful, something that is bright and something that lifts our spirits and tells us God is in control. And he has a wonderful conclusion and end. He is the Alpha and Omega for all those who have trusted in him. We were looking and summarizing in our previous studies because these things all connect together. We looked at his coming in power. We looked, of course, at the Battle of Armageddon. That's back some time ago. That was an interesting study. And then Satan bound in the thousand-year kingdom and then Satan loosed. And then the last rebellion, Satan judged and the great white throne judgment and the old heaven and the old earth passed away. Then we're going to come to new things that we're going to find here and in our last few studies. John is going to be told in chapter 21, we're going to read there now, he's going to be told not only about the eternal state, he's going to be told about a new Jerusalem, we're going to look at that in this study. And then he's going to be told about all things that have been made new. Chapter 21 and verse number 1. I saw, John said, is one of his key words all the way through the book. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And in this new earth... There is no more sea. One of the amazing things about the new heaven and the new earth is the lack of detail about what we are told. It's as if John, when he sees it, is not able to describe it. So beautiful, so grand and so glorious. Paradise like Eden where Adam was, multiplied a million times over the dwelling place for all the saints of all the ages forever. And so John is allowed to describe it in the negative. He tells us of all the things that could not be and would not be and were not going to be there forever. There was the first thing he mentioned. You remember it was one of the key receptacles of dead people in the previous study. Speaks of separation, speaks of sadness. So many Tears have been shed at the dockside. That's the history of the little land that I'm associated with. Half her population went away in days gone by. John says, no more sea. Verse 2, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And he shall wipe away each last tear. It's not a plural. God shall wipe away each last tear from their eyes. No more death. No more sorrow. No more crying. No more pain. The former things are passed away, and he that sat upon the throne. Here's another throne. I wonder, is this the throne of his glory that will be 
forever. An eternal throne, not a judgment throne and not just the kingdom throne. He that sat upon the throne said, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Verse number 9, here's a very interesting thing. There came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven bowls. You say, bowls? Yes, the bowls of the judgments that were poured out in the second half of the tribulation period which took place now in John's position and reckoning more than a thousand years in the past. That's a clue to some of the things that we're going to deal with. It also links together something else in which we need to make a comparison. Keep those two things in your mind. There came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and he talked with me saying come hither and I will show you the bride the lamb's wife and he carried me away. In the spirit John's fourth and final viewpoint position in the book of Revelation in the prison cell in Patmos in the spirit taken into the throne room of heaven in chapter number 4, in the spirit taken into the wilderness to see terrible wilderness things in chapter number 17, and now here in the spirit taken into a very high mountain, a vantage point to see something coming down. And he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, And her light was like unto a stone most precious, like jasper, clear as crystal. Great wall and high, twelve gates. Verse 14, the wall of the city had twelve foundations. Verse 16, the city was four square. The length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, twelve thousand furlongs the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal and he measured the wall thereof a hundred and forty four cubits according to the measure of a man that is of the angel and the wall of the building was like jasper and the city was of pure gold translucent as the idea like unto clear glass and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones and it lists all the way down through and 12 gates, verse 22, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Chapter 22 and verse 1, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of the street of it, on the neither side of the river, there was a tree of life which bare 12 fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the sea tree were for the healing or the health of the nation and there shall be verse 3 no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and the servant shall serve him and they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads and there shall be no night there let's leave our reading there we haven't read every verse there are other things that we could have read first question I suppose that some will ask, and we're keeping this at a level I trust that younger people can understand, though I I know by now that there are also quite a few mature ones, and they have been following and listening as well, and we're glad to see people that have continued right until now. Is this Jerusalem connected with Jerusalem down here? Is it the old city of Jerusalem restored? After all, even though the old Jerusalem was shaken by an earthquake, divided into three parts and so on, then it was restored and fixed up again. And Ezekiel's temple, we touch on that, is built for the kingdom and there is a dwelling place for the prince and so on. And people will come to visit the temple and visit the city of Jerusalem. It has wonderful grand dimensions. We'll touch on that in just a few minutes. So is this here that we have in Revelation 21, And 22 is this just another description of the grandeur of the city and the kingdom? The answer to that question is no. There are quite a few things connected with the city here that we have read about that are clearly not 
connected with the restored city of Jerusalem in the kingdom. The biggest single difference to make it absolutely clear the two pictures and descriptions and cities are not the same is the temple. There is a massive amount of detail in the book of Ezekiel from chapter number 40 on describing the temple and the environment around about the temple that will be in the new city of Jerusalem in the kingdom. But there's one little phrase that connects with this city here in Revelation 21 and 22 and it tells us there is no temple. So the Jerusalem from above. John sees it in the passages that we have read. John sees it coming down twice. I think the simple answer to that point is this. John saw it coming down twice because it comes down twice. Out of heaven. And we'll answer that strange question in just a few minutes time. Jerusalem has a tremendously long history in relation to the Bible, that is the earthly one. First time it's mentioned is in Genesis chapter 14, Abraham and Melchizedek, back there it's called Salem. Judges chapter 19, it's called Jebus, but that's the same place. Back in Joshua, chapter number 10, the first time that it's actually called Jerusalem, the full title of its name. And that's an interesting thing because the first time it's mentioned is connected also with the battle of the miracle where Joshua asked for the sun to stand still and it did. And the last time that Jerusalem, the old earthly city of Jerusalem, is mentioned in the Bible is in Revelation chapter 16. And that's connected with the fall of the cities, the judgment of Babylon, the earthquake in Jerusalem, the end of the bold judgments, and that links with the coming and power of the Lord Jesus, and that links with the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens in Matthew 24. And so there is a possibility that the first time Jerusalem is mentioned and the last time Jerusalem is mentioned the two places are actually connected together in relation to two aspects of the one miracle in the heavens, signs of God. That's very interesting to look into the detail of that. So this Jerusalem that we are studying here is not the restored Jerusalem, the rebuilt Jerusalem. It is a new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from God. Things that are not to be found on the new earth. There is an overlap here. Because I think it's very clear that the Jerusalem that we are looking at here is also part of the fabric of. You see, we've no idea what size the new earth will be. And the dimensions that we have been given for the new Jerusalem, and I'm absolutely convinced that they're literal, we'll touch on that in a second, they will probably be very suitable to the dimensions of the new earth. Even though they sound quite strange in relation to the dimensions of our earth. And I don't think those dimensions will change for the 1000 year kingdom. But things that are not in the new Jerusalem. You see this city carries character of heaven. It carries character of the eternal state. We're told when we're introduced to it for the second time in verse number 9 because John has referred to it, referenced it in 21 and verse 1 and 2 and then again in 21 verse 9. And when it's mentioned the second time it's connected with the bride. It is the dwelling place of the bride of the Lamb. That is another name for the church. And of course those that dwell in the city will give their character to the city because that is always what happens even in earthly terms. A city does not take its character from the grandeur of its buildings. No, we've seen that in recent days. A city takes its character from the activity of the people that live in it or 
come to it. And that also applies here in the Word of God. And so we have a great, beautiful list of things that will not be found in the omega of the new heaven and the new earth. Most of them still will be found in the kingdom. I hope we're clear on that. Differences between the two. But they will not be found in this new Jerusalem that we're looking at in this study. John says, no more sea. That's in the new earth. No more death, verse 4. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more crying, no more pain, no more sickness, no more curse, no more temple. I don't think we read the verses, but it also says no sun and no moon because the Lamb is the light and so there is neither light in the sky that's needed nor is there artificial lamps that are needed either because the Lamb himself will be the illumination. Isn't that a wonderful thought? He himself will be the source of light. The Bible says God is light. And then the day in which we're living we see the manifestation of God's love. And the one who is the word that spoke at creation, John says he came into this world as the word and revealed himself as the light and life and love and word of God. All those things are developed in John's other book in his gospel. And so we see here at the conclusion of all things in the new heaven and the new earth that the Lamb himself is the light of this eternal city and eternal place that we are going to. Some of you will ask straight away, you see, is it just a, a symbolic description? If it is not a description of the literal Jerusalem in the kingdom period, then is it just something totally symbolic? Is it not a real sitting at all? Is it just a kind of description that John is giving of what things will be like in the eternal state and there actually isn't any place in the new heaven and the new earth that actually will be called the city of Jerusalem? I think the answer to that is yes, it is a real city. And of course the next question that comes very, very quickly after that is then are the dimensions that we have read in Revelation chapter 21, is it possible that these strange dimensions are literal? And some people say no, they're just symbolic. It, it's just a description of a huge city. End of. I don't think so. I think the descriptions are absolutely Literal. Let me say this, with very, very, very few exceptions, and I, I, I don't want to go into that because that gets a little bit complicated, where you get numbers set down in the Word of God, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1,042, 3 and a half, 1,200, whatever, where you get numbers set down in the Word of God. The normal thing to do in relation to accurate interpretation is to take them as literal numbers, unless there is anything that suggests that they are not. There is the occasional exception. Don't forget that back in the days in which the Bible was written, they had no method of mechanical computation. And sometimes they wrote down a figure like 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. In other words, just put some more knots after it. They weren't able to accurately describe a number that ran to billions and then to trillions and then to quadrillions. And those names for numbers have actually only been recently made up because computers can do those calculations. I can't do them in my head. And so where you get 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, that's obviously describing a vast number. 
But that number in itself is not a fixed number. Where you get a fixed number, the, like 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. And where you get numbers like you have here, which are exact numbers, I think they're literal. The dimensions, let me just touch on this now, the dimensions of the land that God gave to Abraham and confirmed again in Ezekiel in relation to the kingdom, those dimensions are absolutely literal. We can connect them to the physical geography of this earth, the river of Egypt, the Euphrates on the north and east, and the great sea on the west. The bounds of the land are absolutely literal. The dimensions of tribal possessions. I don't know if you've ever read Ezekiel chapter 47 and 48. The dimensions of the tribal possessions which run in parallel strips the whole way across the land from Dan right down to Gad down at the bottom with the place for the priests and the sanctuary and the temple and the Levites and the prince right there in the very centre and Jerusalem in the middle of that. Those are strange descriptions but I believe without any difficulty they're all literal. And I believe they dimensions of the millennial city and the temple that we have in Ezekiel 40 to 46 that even though those dimensions are quite strange and very difficult to calculate and work out I believe they're also literal and I believe when we come to Revelation chapter 21 the dimensions of the new Jerusalem that John saw coming down twice I saw that, that I believe the dimensions of it are literal as well. In our reading, it said that he measured it. And it was measured with a golden reed. The one who was talking with John, the angel, and he measured the city and the gates, and the city was square. It was as long as it was broad, and it was as tall as the length and the width. And the length and the breadth and the height are the same, and they are 12,000 furlongs. Well, you say to me, what's a furlong? Well, if you came from Kentucky or some of those places in America, you wouldn't have to ask what a furlong was, because I suppose out there most people measure things in furlongs. Nowadays it is connected with horses and horse racing. And back in the days in which John was writing, a furlong was actually, it, it, that's an English word, it was connected in the Greek language, stadion. It was connected with, that word sounds familiar, doesn't it? It was connected with stadiums. And it actually was the length of the running track, not around the outside of the stadium, but from one end to the other. We would call it today a 200 metre race. When you get to more than that, the middle distance running in our stadiums today, you have to start to go round part or all or two or three times round the outside. Back in those days when games started, a stadium was the length of the 200 metres, we would call it, running track. And so we can convert from 12,000 stadium, we can convert it across into metres and then we can multiply the meters square and it comes out to a very interesting number 2220 kilometers squared which is 4,928 and 400 4 comma 928 comma 400 4.9, or if you want to round it up in your head, 5 million kilometres square. Oh, you say, nothing could be that size. That's just the base. What about the height? Some people suggest that the city is a cube. They relate that to the dimension of the Holy of Holies in the temple right back to the tabernacle. I'm not so convinced. I think it's possible because it mathematically certainly is possible. It's possible that the shape is actually a pyramid. And actually if you take the shape as a pyramid rising to a single story at the middle, 
where at the apex of that story uh, in chapter number 22 is the throne and the river runs from the throne. That begins to make more pictorial sense and also it's a pyramid and the buildings rise at a slope the height of the walls also makes sense. I think the pyramid shape makes a lot of sense when we come to study the picture of the city. I'm not convinced that Noah's Ark wasn't an elongated pyramid shape as well, that the top story was much narrower than the middle story and the bottom story where the elephants and things were, uh, were the widest and that of course provided the best ballast in the boat as well. I think the two pictures maybe are connected together though not in size but possibly in shape. And so we're looking at a city which is 4.9 million kilometres square. And we've really no idea how many dwelling places could be within it because we've no idea what size the buildings are or how many buildings are on each storey or how much each storey is stepped in as it goes up. We don't know. But we have this wonderful picture of a square pyramid-shaped building with foundations that look like shining diamonds and John says I actually saw when he describes it the second time John said I actually saw the foundations he would say a city of those dimensions wouldn't even fit on this earth well the question of course is does the city have to fit on this earth I'm not convinced that that's the case I think the city's dimensions are designed for the new earth in actual fact, the square kilometres of Russia, I know the countries are not square, but Russia is 16.4 million kilometres square. That's four times bigger than the city in square area. China's 9.3 and America's 9.1 and Canada's 9 and Brazil is 8.5 and, and Argentina or Australia Australia, no, I think it is, is 7.7. .7. Argentina comes slightly further down the list. I think it's number 8. Australia, 7.7. .7. India is 3.3. .3. So if we were going down through the list of the square kilometres of countries in this earth, actually you'd get to India. That's amazing, isn't it? Because India is the most densely populated country in the world, but its area is not as large as these others. And so there are individual countries in this world that, that within their borders you actually could set the city down if you wanted to, but I don't think it does. The point I'm trying to get over is this, that the dimensions are not as fantastical as we sometimes imagine. You can't really stand in a high place and see all of Russia. You couldn't you know, even with Google Maps, if you can see it on your computer, it still gives you no, comp no impression of the size of China. When you fly from one side of America or Canada to the other, it surprises a lot of people in this little place where I come from that the distance across the Atlantic to New York is far less than the distance from New York the whole way across to the other side, isn't it? Till you get to the Pacific. And these distances are not actually really visible from our own standpoint down here. Once you go up in an aeroplane, you get above the clouds and you never actually get to see the whole of a country. And when we come to these dimensions in Revelation chapter 21, we just get the impression they're impossible because we can't really imagine them. I'm trying to get the point across that, first of all, they're not impossible because God is the architect and creator and secondly, the dimensions are not as fantastical or strange as we even think they are. Now, of course, that brings us to another hard question. Is the New Jerusalem only on the earth in the kingdom period? I think the answer to that is yes. And then some of you will say, but you have been suggesting that it came down twice. Well, I'm not suggesting that because we actually read that in our passage. Chapter 21, verses 1 and 2, John saw the new city coming down on the new heaven and the new earth. But chapter 21 and verse number 9, listen carefully now. John is taken by one of the angels that had the seven bolts. That's a hint. 
just as he was taken by one of the angels that had the seven bowls to see the destruction of the awful city called Babylon and the system and the woman and the beast that was there. And so what I'm suggesting is that at the end of the kingdom period, after the judgment, John is being taken back. Because time for John, where he is in his vision, is elastic. John is being taken back by an angel that poured out a bowl a thousand years back in time before. That takes John back to the beginning of the kingdom period. He would link that with the bowl angel. And so the second coming down actually in time happens first. But the first coming down that we read about is put first in our reading because it's linked with the new heaven and the new earth that comes after the last judgment. John's describing it in summary form. He said, I saw the last judgment. I saw the conclusion of the old earth. I saw the new heaven and the new earth and the new city coming down. That's all summarized for us just in four or five verses. Then when we get down to verse number nine of chapter number 21, the angel says to John, come and I'll show you all the detail of the city. And John says, I saw it coming down again. And so I do think, I do believe in my heart that What we have in the second description is a city that comes down. You say the whole way down does it sit in Israel. Israel's not the size of Russia. No, you're absolutely right about that. The city would not fit inside Israel, not in any shape or form or suggestion. No, I think the city's over Israel. There is a strange passage in Isaiah chapter 4 It carries one of the most famous and oldest names in relation to Jesus. It calls him in there in Isaiah chapter 4, the branch of Jehovah. We'll see that again in our next study. That goes away back to Genesis chapter number 49. Then Isaiah chapter 4 where it speaks about the branch of Jehovah. It speaks about Jerusalem being purged. That's this Jerusalem down here in the kingdom. And it also speaks, if you examine the words that are in there carefully, it speaks about a canopy and a cover and a shade being over the land because of the increase and change in the climate and the heat and the rain. After all, if corn is going to grow on top of the mountains, and we get that in Psalm 72, what kind of climate are we going to have in the valleys? And if Israel is going to be even more fertile than it is today, I think, I think the whole land of Israel will become just like a propagation center, like a great national greenhouse. And to preserve people from excess heat and to give them shade from the sun. I see a lovely picture of this city. I think that's what's in Isaiah chapter 4. It's described for us. A shade and a canopy and a cover sitting right over the land of Israel. I think that fills another picture, you know. The old vision that Jacob saw in Genesis 28 and that Jesus reconfirmed to Nathaniel in John chapter number 1. The angels of God not coming down from heaven and going up. No, the angels of God going up and coming down in both places, Genesis 28 and John 1. And that's a very unusual construction, isn't it? We think of angels from heaven going out doing the things that Jesus has sent them to do. But in both those places it talks about the angels going up first before it speaks about them coming down. Maybe that makes sense of a connection and a link between the city which will be a shade and a canopy over Israel, not touching the land, but there visible. The dwelling place of the bride and the gates that can be closed at night. But there is no temple in there because none is needed, even though there is a temple down below in the 
literally restored Jerusalem, and so you have two Jerusalems. You have the Jerusalem above, and you have the Jerusalem beneath. And then, of course, the Jerusalem beneath will be done away with when this old earth has been destroyed. There's another question. I touched on that in our last study, and I didn't answer it. Where are all the saints of all the ages when all the dead are judged at the great white throne? Maybe. I could be wrong. But maybe if I've got this double picture and the city in two places right, then she is like Noah's Ark. Then she is that golden dwelling place that carries us from here. Past the judgment of God and the dissolution of this earth and the heavens to there, She is the eternal dwelling place of the saints. And then she will have her final resting place in the new heaven and the new earth, wherein will only dwell righteousness. No sin, no contamination will ever come, and all of it will last forever. And John says, I couldn't describe the things that I saw in relation to that. And so I was allowed to write it all down in the negative. I told about the things that were not there. Some of these things and numbers have been a little bit complicated. I trust that even if you have to go back over them and listen to them twice and even write some things down and do a little calculation, I hope you will agree with me in my summarization. I I just like this picture of the old Jerusalem restored and Ezekiel's temple and all the rest, and above, visible but uncontaminatable, a dwelling place eternally from there forever for those who are the bride of the Lamb. Now some questions at the conclusion of our study again, and thank you for staying with us to the end. How many new things... Did we mention at the start of the study there is a new heaven and then there is a new something else and a new something else? There's maybe four things you could mention there. Is New Jerusalem a real city? I hope you get that one right. Is it the same as the earthly Jerusalem? I hope you get that one right. Are the dimensions literal? I've no doubt whatsoever about that, so I hope you get that one right. What shape is it? There are two suggestions, but there is one that I've told you I prefer, so you can think about that and even do a little scribble and then give me what you think is the right answer for that. What is the size of square of the base and then the height? Don't forget that a pyramid also, the height can be the same size as the length and the breadth. It doesn't have to be a square or a cube just because the height is the same size as the length. How many countries? In the world at this point in time, that's a secular kind of question, but it's interesting how many countries in the world are big enough that the city could actually sit on. That just tells us that the the dimensions are not fantastical, and there actually is an answer to that. Does it sit on this world even in the kingdom? I hope you're clear about that. And then, is it in and on and part of the new heaven and the new earth? You'll find that even though... Our study was maybe a little bit complicated that the answers were not so complicated at all. Very quickly now, the answers to the questions at the end of the judgment one. What does not happen at the start of the kingdom? The unsaved dead are not raised. The first resurrection ends in Revelation chapter 20. When did it begin? It begins at the resurrection of Jesus. What would be wrong? If there was no resurrection at all, there would be no salvation. What is the second death? It is the judgment of the wicked. The throne is great because of its majesty, white because of its authority, its purity, and the throne because of its authority. So we've majesty and authority and purity all connected together. How many books are opened? 
The answer is four. Can you give the names of any of them? The Word of God, the Book of the Living, the Book of Life, and the Book of Works. And what is the last thing that John is shown in his visions? And of course the answer to that is the new heaven and the new earth. Thank you again for listening to what I trust, though it has been a little bit technical, has been a very, very interesting study of the New Jerusalem. There is a little bit more to come before we get to the end of the book of Revelation. Thank you and God bless you again for listening today.